Um, so we are on chapter four, text three. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Om Ajnana Timirandasyam Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupaka Damayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandehang Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Cha, Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhunam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Cha. He Krishna Karuna Sindho, Dina Bando Jagatpate, Gopesha Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta Namostute, Dapta Kanchana Gorangi, Radhe Vrindavan Eshvari, Vrishabhanu Sute Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha, Kripa Sindhu Bia Evacha Patitanam Pabanebio Vaishnavebio Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Shri Advaita Gadad Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, so here is our <coughs> verse for today. Sa evayam maya te dia. Are we going to? Sa evayam maya te dia. Sa evayam maya te dia. Yo. Four text three. Apologize. Yeah, if you, <laughs> for people with cell phones that have their uh, Veda base or their uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita thing open, you can follow along. Yoga prokta puratanaha. Yoga prokta paratana. Yoga prokta paratana. Ta paratana. Bhakto si me saka cheti. Bhakto si me saka cheti. Bhakto si me saka Rahasyam he tadutamam. Rahasyam he tadutamam. Rahasyam he tadutamam. Sa evayam, sa evayam maya te dia. Sa evayam maya te dia. Yoga prokta puratanaham. Yoga prokta puratanaham. Bhakto si me sakacheti. Bhakto si me sakacheti. Rahasyam he tadutamam. Sa evayam maya te dia. Sa evayam maya te dia. Yoga prokta puratanaham. Yoga prokta 
Puratana Bhakto Sime Sakacheti Bhakto Sime Sakacheti Rahasyam Hetaduttamam Rahasyam Hetaduttamam Anyone want to give it a whirl? Sa evayam maya te dya. Yoga prokta puratana. Yoga prokta puratana. Bhakto si me sakacheti. Bhakto si me sakacheti. Rahasyam hetad utamam. Rahasyam hetad utamam. Sorry, small or by Shabbos? Yoga Prokta Puratana Bhakto Sime Sakacheti Rahasyam Hetadutamam So the translation reads, uh, That very ancient science of the relationship with the Supreme is today told by me to you, because you are my devotee as well as my friend, and therefore can understand the transcendental mystery of this science. So we can say this responsibly. I'll say a phrase, and then you all repeat, and then we'll... And is the sound good in the back? Can you all hear Mara as well? Uh, should I turn up the volume or just move the mic? What's your preference? Uh, turn up the volume okay. because of course. Um, the sorry. mic's already pretty close. Yes, that's true. <laughs> sorry, Mark. Uh, how's that? <laughs> Nobody knows until I say something. <laughs> okay, well, here we go. Is that any better? It doesn't sound any different. I don't well, know. Because you're close up, Maharaj. What's that? You hear yourself instead of the speakers. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe, okay. Or maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> All right, so as long as it's okay. That very ancient science... That very ancient, ancient science, science... Of the relationship with the Supreme... Of the relationship with the Supreme... Is today told by me to you. Is today told by me to you. Because you are my devotee. Because you are my devotee. As well as my friend. As well as my friend. And can therefore understand. And can therefore understand. The transcendental mystery of this science. The transcendental mystery of this science. Okay, so Prabhupada's given us a purport here. There are two classes of men, namely the devotee and the demon. The Lord selected Arjun as a recipient of this great science. Owing to his being a devotee of the Lord... But for the demon, it is not possible to understand this great mysterious science. There are a number of editions of this great book of knowledge. Some of them have commentaries by the devotees, and some have commentaries by the demons. Commentations by the devotees, commentation by the devotees is real, whereas that of the demons is useless. Arjuna accepts Sri Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And any commentary on the Gita following in the footsteps of Arjuna is real devotional service to the cause of this great science. The demoniac, however, do not accept Lord Krishna as he is. Instead, they concoct something about Krishna and mislead general readers from the path of Krishna's instruction. Here is a warning about such misleading paths. One should try to follow the disciplic succession from Arjun and thus be benefited by this great science of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Yoga Prokta Puratana Bhakto Sime Sakacheti Rahasyam Hetad Uttama that very ancient science of the relationship with the Supreme is today told by me to you because you are my devotee as well as my friend and can therefore understand the transcendental mystery of this science. So 
So the uh, process of devotional service is being described uh, by Krishna to Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Arjuna has claimed he's not going to fight. Uh, and then after saying that, he asks Krishna to please instruct him that he is willing to place his thinking at the feet of Krishna and accept whatever Krishna wants to tell him. And so that's what happens then. Krishna takes over and begins to describe um, the process of devotional service. Now, we're in chapter 4 here, which is called um, Transcendental Knowledge. Uh, before this chapter was chapter 3, which was called Karma Yoga. And after this chapter, chapter 5, there's a chapter called Karma Yoga Action in Krishna Consciousness. So chapter 3 and chapter 5 are very similar. In fact, in one sense they could be considered the same uh, with just this interlude of chapter 4 sort of sandwiched between them. And uh, the reason Krishna is describing knowledge is in uh, chapter 3, text 30. Krishna asked Arjuna to fight with knowledge. So now in this chapter 4, he's describing that knowledge that Krishna is asking Arjuna to fight in. He's not just asking him to fight uh, like some kind of robot or some kind of uh, blind follower, but he's asking him to fight uh, with knowledge. So um, this concept here uh, that's being talked about in the first three verses of this chapter, verse 1, verse 2, and verse 3, is uh, the idea of uh, <coughs> transcendental um, knowledge and where does it come from. So technically, this is kind of an uh, epistemic part of the Bhagavad Gita. Epistemology... Um, maybe some of you know, is the uh, study of what knowledge is, where it comes from, and to what extent we can trust it. So this is um, the idea of epistemology. The study of knowledge, where it comes from, what its nature is, and to what extent we can trust it. So epistemology is generally accepted as an important part of philosophy because uh, along with talking about knowledge we have to have some concept of what we mean when we use the word knowledge and particularly today um, our focus will be um, with knowledge, um, where does it come from? And, you know, it's reasonable to ask the question. We're listening to this Bhagavad Gita. Why should we care? Uh, where is this, uh, I, where are these ideas come from? Um, are we reasonable? Are we um, actually um, within a... Um, some kind of uh, plausibility to be able to trust what we're hearing. After all, this was discussed 5,000 years ago. Is it relevant to today? These are all important and reasonable questions, and these are all epistemic questions. You know, um, it's come from 5,000 years ago. Why should we care? Is it applicable today? Um, what is the credentials that we could listen to this knowledge and feel that we're getting something out of it, that we're not just listening to mythology or we're not just listening to some ancient ideas that are completely out of date? So, 
But of course, we could ask this same question about any knowledge, you know, uh, that we're hearing, you know, knowledge that we hear today, knowledge that someone may be speaking um, in any uh, platform. And um, I think that's an important thing to think about. If we look at um, our own Western traditional uh, sources of knowledge, usually when people uh, study the idea of um, uh, philosophical knowledge, philosophical knowledge in our Western tradition goes back to the Greeks. And um, uh, the Greeks were uh, the beginning of the way that we think today. And many of us probably have never thought about it. But um, if you grew up in the Western world, um, Europe, you know, the Americas, um, Oceania, or any, any of those kind of modern places, this kind of leaves out India and it leaves out the Orient, where it's a different kind of um, uh, philosophical uh, foundation is there in the history. If you grew up in the Western tradition, you are, without knowing it, influenced by uh, Greek thinking that later became uh, European thinking, that later became world thinking. And this is why oftentimes when we hear um, Vedic knowledge, certainly when uh, devotees were first hearing Prabhupada discuss things, they misunderstood lots of things. And it's easy to misunderstand what the Vedas are actually saying because we have already a foundational understanding of the philosophy that uh, we kind of have churning around in our mind. Now, some people may actually uh, very thoroughly think about philosophy in a, in a detailed way, while others um, just kind of have a few bits and bobs of uh, philosophy floating around in their mind and they never really come to any overall perspective of anything. But in any case, <clears throat> Many commonly said things, many commonly uh, discussed things, and many principles are just taken for granted in our everyday thinking. And these ideas and principles aren't there by accident. They're there because Western thinking has a um, sequence. It has a long uh, history. And uh, many people over the centuries, debated certain issues and took what was there given to them and tried to come up with answers for questions and various controversies that had been there before. They tried to resolve them in various ways. And so today we have the descendants of these uh, you know, philosoph philosophical ideas that were originally given to us uh, by the Greeks, at least if you're coming from Western philosophy. Um, what I find kind of uh, hard to take is that if you uh, study or you do some reading into Western philosophy, you'll see how Western philosophy completely ignores the Vedas almost completely, even though it's quite obvious that the Greeks borrowed a lot from the Vedic literature. Uh, and uh, But the Greeks only had fragments of what the Vedic literature gives us. They only had fragments of it. And, you know, someone can accuse us or um, a person like myself, we're partial to a particular view or we have been um, somehow or other um, influenced and now we're, you know, in a some kind of chauvinistic way beating the drum for a Vedic uh, thinking. <coughs> but actually, if you make a study 
of Vedic knowledge, and you make a study of the Greeks and their various uh, theories and ideas, you'll discover that obviously one of them is a complete picture and the other is just pieces of a complete picture. Um, the Greeks got some things, they didn't have other things, they made up things to fill in the, the blanks, and uh, it didn't work. And today, we still have issues in philosophy that many people have no answers for. But that's because they're coming completely through the legacy, this historic legacy, that's come to us from the Greeks. And um, if we look at the ancient Greeks, we see a lot of interesting things. For instance, generally the Greeks worshipped uh, various demigods. Now, these are the same demigods that they worship in India today. I don't think in Greece people worship demigods much anymore, if at all. But in India they still do. And although they had different names, uh, these same people that the Greeks in general um, were worshipping were the same group of people that in India they worship. And for that matter, it wasn't just India and Greece, but Scandinavia, you had demigods. The Romans had demigods. The Polynesians had demigods. American Indians had demigods. In Africa, they had demigods. So this idea of worshipping some group of people that had power over the um, workings of this universe that we live in uh, was pretty much spread throughout the entire planet. And uh, <coughs> you could build a case that uh, there was a lot of similarity between the way that these uh, people were described and what they did and how they interacted with one another. Of course, with the advent of the Christian era, uh, demigods were pushed to the back and finally kind of debunked, as, at least uh, according to um, uh, not only Christian thinking, but modern scientific thinking. Um, but there's no reason to think that there are not controllers of the universe um, and certainly all of our ancestors thought so, no matter what part of the world you come from. So um, I don't want to really belabor that point because that's a whole point in itself. But what I do want to talk about is the fact that, well, with the beginning of Greek philosophy, there was this idea of putting aside these demigods, Xenophanes was one of the early pre-Socratic Greeks who um, did not find anything useful in worshipping demigods. We see that the beginning of Greek philosophy, these early pre-Socratics, um, they all were united on the fact, for the most part, that they were not interested in the demigods. They wanted to find some other causes for what's going on in the world other than uh, some kind of supernatural beings, be it a god or be it many gods. So this is why, and this is precisely why, uh, modern academia in colleges, if you learn philosophy, this is precisely why people will give great respect to the Greeks because they put aside supernatural or personal causes and began to try to explain and describe the universe completely from the standpoint of non-personal and non-supernatural causes. Of course, you can't get away from some kind of metaphysics or some kind of uh, uh, special stuff somewhere along the line. But 
they tried to put aside this thinking that there is a being. They tried to put aside the thinking that there are possibly many beings and that they have some sway over the way both the universe is created and both the way that it works. Uh, and just stop and think about that for a minute because this is exactly why uh, some people are hard-nosed materialists. They believe there is only matter and the workings of matter are as far as you need to go. You don't need to understand anything else. That uh, If you study physics, if you study chemistry, um, and you understand those laws, then you have pretty much understood as much as modern uh, humans understand about the world around us. And they never realize that they have left aside a huge amount of things that they have not talked about at all. A huge amount of things that are off their radar completely. So the modern materialistic, mechanistic uh, view of things is a view that goes back to the Greeks. It goes back to this idea that there are no uh, potentates or powerful beings, that there are, there's no certainly any single individual being, but there is something that the world or the universe springs from, and mostly it can be described uh, by uh, ideas. And it, um, in the modern day, by material ideas, ideas that only describe matter. But of course, um, what did the Greeks actually think? That everything comes from something. They were, they were fixed on that. Now this is even our Greek philosophers who had given up any thinking about demigods. Uh, these Greek philosophers, they thought everything must come from something, which they called the archi. Uh, some kind of something, you know. We can see that basically they borrowed the concept of the Brahman, Brahman from Indian uh, thinking, but they didn't call it that. And um, they weren't clear as to what it was, you know, that, uh, that there is some kind of all one, and everything must come from that all one. So if everything comes from an all one, then everything is connected in some kind of way. And um, they wanted to understand what that all one is. Now, what did they think that all one could be? Uh, now, interesting again, uh, the Greek philosophers, they had uh, elements that they believed in. They believed in earth, water, fire, and air. Sound familiar? <laughs> Now, uh, this is obviously from Bhagavad Gita. Bhumir apo nalo vayu kamana budire vacha hankaram itiyame bina prakritirashtada. So Krishna explains in seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, there is Bhumir, earth, uh, apo, water, uh, uh, analo, fire, uh, vayu, air, kam is ether, so uh, these things are described, and these are fairly basic concepts in the Vedic tradition, that there is solid substances, gaseous substances, there is energy, and there is um, uh, liquid substance. So these are basic things. Now, for some reason, the Greeks didn't like ether. They don't talk about it. Uh, but they had earth, water, fire, and air. And among the early Greeks, they had big shootout at OK Corral as to, well, which one of these is the archi, the, the primal? Is it air? Is it water? 
is it fire? If everything's all one, it must come from one something. So is it that air produces fire and water? Or is it water producing air and fire? Or is it fire producing air and water? So, uh, um, and earth, you know. So at any rate, they didn't have a clear idea of which comes first. However, in Srimad Bhagavatam, this is described, that from sound, we get ether from ether, we get air from air, we get um, um, uh, we get uh, uh, form, and from form, we get fire from fire, we get uh, it goes on, you know, it's, it's described that there's a whole cascade of how from the Brahman we get next what we call the Pradhan. And from the Pradhan we get the Mahatat. Uh, from the uh, Mahatat then we get, uh, <coughs> we get finally various elements. So it starts off as just this Brahman, which is actually spiritual, but it becomes uh, materialized into something we call the Pradhan. So from the Brahman we get the Pradhan, and then from the Pradhan we get earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. We get these other elements. So they gradually come one from another, so from a non-differentiated uh, whole, we get these constituent parts, and we get this differentiated universe that we actually see all around us. And this is how the Vedic literature describes it. The Greeks didn't know this, and so they didn't know where to go with this idea of how the all-one is uh, done. Now... If someone makes the argument that, well, all, all this stuff comes from uh, long ago, and how do we know if it has any value today? Well, how do we know if the, the Greek stuff has any value today? The reason it has value today is people are still talking about it, that uh, nobody has uh, completely thrown out the Greeks, although we find that many ideas that they came up with have been supplanted or modified but the ideas that they came up with, you know, in 2,500 years ago or so, are still being talked about. And uh, so that should make us think. Now, with the Vedas, it's the same way, even more so, that these ideas between Arjuna and Krishna are still being talked about today. Uh, there is... Um, very compelling evidence that if you try to understand this world system, this uh, philosophy, if you try to understand it, you will discover that it's reasonable and that it's self-consistent and that it actually is fairly exhaustive. It does explain so many things. So for that reason, even if we didn't, even if, you know, somebody came off the street, you know, in rags and handed us this book, you know, and said, I think this is great. Um, even if we didn't know where it came from, if we had all kinds of doubts, what's compelling about it is that it's expansive, it's self-consistent, and it's plausible. And that's the reason why, even though these ideas come from 5,000 years ago, that today we're still talking about them. At least some people are. Um, again, Western culture is pretty blind to Vedic knowledge for the most part. Western culture usually doesn't discuss it. If you take a philosophy class in academia, you will not generally hear much about Vedic knowledge. And what you do here will be mostly misunderstood uh, explanation of the Vedic knowledge. 
And it is true that in India, generally people don't understand the Vedas there either, any more than in the Western world most people understand Christianity. You know, uh, For the most part, people have never made a systematic understanding of these uh, philosophical uh, traditions. They're rich, and people don't understand them. Um, so, it's reasonable to ask, what can we make of these ideas? Can we uh, put them uh, into our daily thinking? Can we actually act on them? And the answer is actually yes. Uh, we suggest even that, that uh, Krishna is speaking to Arjuna, not just some uh, metaphysical principles that have no application, but he's speaking things that actually can be used in everyday life and can make your life better and can help you understand the bewildering, strange way that the world that we find ourselves in works. It's quite obvious that the world works in a way that does not seem straightforward at all. And uh, things happen for reasons that uh, strike us as bizarre or obscure. You know, when we see things happen, we wonder, why does it happen like that? You know, uh, but there are reasons for the, re for the way things happen. And, of course, as we were saying, the Greeks tried to figure them out. And um, they got some ideas. Uh, and it's quite uh, reasonable and quite probable that some of the ideas they came up with were ideas that were pollinated from the Vedic knowledge of India. However, they didn't have the whole picture. And so they weren't able to give a full account of how our world comes about and how our world works. Um, so later philosophers, uh, Germans and British, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They added layers and layers on that, and then we have various things that exist today. And we see that there are very, uh, there are competing schools in various philosophy. Some people say it's like this. Some people say it's like that. And who decides at the end? You know, who, which philosophy do we go for? So, although this was spoken 5,000 years ago, if, we're, if we today take Greek philosophy seriously from 2,500 years ago, then we should uh, seriously think, well, why not take a look at the Vedic philosophy? Now, uh, many times uh, it's said that the early pre-Socratics, they didn't have a full philosophy, but uh, later uh, Greek philosophy became more complete. Um, but uh, compared to the Vedic philosophy, even whatever the Greeks had is just, you know, a uh, group of fragments. So uh, this is uh, something that uh, we need to think about. That's why I was talking about this idea of epistemology. We are discovering, well, why should we believe what we're hearing? Where does it come from? And um, what are its credentials? And uh, so in chapter 4, Krishna is explaining to Arjuna that he first explained the Vedic science to the sun god Viviswan. And Viviswan explained it to Manu, and Manu explained it to Ikshvaku. So uh, we have this knowledge being handed down. Then we hear something puzzling and maybe even distressing, that the knowledge is lost, Krishna says. that I describe this knowledge, but today the knowledge appears to be lost. So I'm again describing it to you, Arjuna. So what this means is that we live in a strange and funny universe. And it seems odd that uh, there's no explanation for 
how this universe got here or what we're supposed to do in it. But actually there is. There is an explanation of how this universe got here and what we're supposed to do in it. However, as the years go by, as the centuries go by, this knowledge becomes more and more diffused, covered with misconceptions, and eventually gets submerged altogether, and uh, people lose track of it altogether, which is certainly what happens in uh, our person, our particular time here. We're in Kali Yuga, and in Kali Yuga, it is the time when um, the darkness of ignorance becomes the most pervasive, the most thick. So in Kali Yuga, we lose track of the true knowledge more than we do at any other time. But that doesn't mean everybody loses track of the knowledge, but most lose track of the knowledge. So this is the nature of how um, the uh, process of spiritual life um, unfolds, that we have a time where most people are aware of basic knowledge of spiritual life, of the universe, how it came to be, what we need to do in it, and then gradually by degrees that knowledge gets broken, lost, um, misconceived, and we come to the point where we have a world where almost everybody has no conception of how we got here, what we're doing here, etc., etc. So uh, Krishna explains that. Uh, he's, it's not a mystery. And um, it's uh, actually built into the system. And we could ask, well, why is it like that? Why? Why do we have knowledge? And then that knowledge gets taken away, especially if it's important knowledge, knowledge for what we're doing and how things work. And, of course, the reason is that we have knowledge or we have ignorance according to our desires. So Krishna is explaining in Bhagavad Gita that mata smritya jnanam apohanam cha so, from me come knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So, Krishna is giving what you want. If you want to enjoy in this material world, and you want to ignore any relationship with God, if you want to ignore any uh, duties incumbent upon you, then, yeah, I want, you're saying, I want ignorance. And Krishna's saying, you really sure you want ignorance? And you're saying, no, no, I'm sure I want ignorance. Give it to me. And so Krishna, <laughs> all right, there it is. The fog rolls right in and, wow, I don't know nothing no more. <laughs> I'm just bewildered, you know. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, if you want knowledge, then Krishna gradually lifts the fog and gives you the knowledge. It's owing to your desire. So we have free will. And if we want to understand what's really going on in this world, then we can understand it. And Krishna will ha gradually help us to become more and more aware of what's really going on. However, if we prefer to try to just enjoy the um, sugar plums and uh, cherries of the world that we live in, you know, in our little plate then Krishna will say, all right, you're sure you want to do that. And to, to do that for a long period of time, you need some ignorance because otherwise you'll realize that uh, the material world is full of undesirable things. And um, uh, even those things that we want when we get them, they don't satisfy us. They're mixed with things we don't want. We've always got flies in our soup and all that kind of thing. Uh, and the uh, material world 
gives us um, uh, sometimes perversely exactly what we don't want. You know, so all these things are part of it. Um, and that's why Krishna is speaking to Arjuna. He's saying, because you are my friend, you are not demoniac, I'm giving you this knowledge because you are my friend. You are open to this knowledge. You say you want knowledge, so I'm giving you knowledge. Uh, if Arjuna was the other way, uh, uh, if Arjuna was demoniac, meaning that he was selfish and uninterested in um, the world around him, in helping others, or in uh, becoming the best person he could be, if Arjuna was uninterested in that, then Krishna wouldn't be speaking to him. He wouldn't be giving him this information. So um, I'm going to put a bookmark there and ask and see if we have any questions from our uh, group here. Anybody? Um, um, I tried to do something a little different today. I wanted to contrast and compare uh, the Vedic uh, traditional explanation of the universe with the more uh, commonly understood, um, either subconsciously or consciously, uh, presentation of Western philosophy. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, Marge, things very, very um, uh, intellectually uh, stimulating uh, explanation you're providing in a spiritual way. Um, so, my question is well, based on um, our Western or our Western or materialistic, however you want to call it, our way of thinking about knowledge, uh, knowledge does not depend on uh, any emotions, let alone devotion or friendship, let alone devotion or friendship in towards God, so, to friendship to God. Mm -hmm. So uh, how does it make sense uh, that uh, one needs to have uh, devotion to Krishna to be friendly towards Krishna in order to understand these teachings. Right, right. Um, this gets back into, as I was just mentioning, the difference between what we mean by knowledge when we talk about it in the Vedic tradition and what we mean by knowledge when we talk about it in the Western tradition. These are two complete different concepts, you know. Um, and I say that there are four commonly used, completely misunderstood concepts in the Western world. That is love, freedom, knowledge, and happiness, you know. that Everybody thinks they know what they mean when they say knowledge or happiness or love or freedom. But if you ask them a few questions about it, you'll realize they don't have any clue of what they're talking about when they're, they're talking about these things. In the Western world, knowledge generally means, um, well, first usually it means uh, particular information according to a particular occupation. You know, uh, I have knowledge of uh, quantum physics or I understand um, how auto mechanics works or um, I'm a computer tech. You know, I understand uh, various... Uh, computer systems, you know, so uh, that's generally what people think of as knowledge, and beyond that, they think of some basic, um, you know, philosophical dips and drib dribbles, you know, um, and so this kind of knowledge, uh, certainly you can get just by trying to school yourself in them, either by going to a college or reading books, etc. But um, if you read in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes what knowledge is, and uh, it strikes us as very different sounding than that, you know. Um, and uh, uh, I'm trying to remember where that verse is, you know, where Krishna describes knowledge. He describes 20 things, uh, more or less, which uh, comprise knowledge. It may be in this chapter, as a matter of fact. 
me see if I can find it. Oh, that may be what you're what I'm talking about. Let me see if we I can. I think so. Yeah. But Chapter thirteen. Yeah, I think. Qualities, so. and right. I declare these to be knowledge. Right, right. Thirteen. What is it? Uh, eight through twelve, Mark. Right, right. So, this is huge verse: humility, pridelessness, nonviolence, tolerance, simplicity, approaching a bona fide spiritual master, cleanliness, steadiness, self-control, renunciation of the objects of sense gratification, absence of false ego, the perception of the evil of birth, death, old age, and disease, detachment, freedom from entanglement with children, wife, home, and the rest, even-mindedness amidst pleasant and unpleasant events, constant and unalloyed devotion to me, aspiring to live in a solitary place, detachment from the general mass of people, accepting the importance of self-realization, <clears throat> and the philosophical search for the absolute truth. All these I declare to be knowledge, and besides this, whatever there else there may be is ignorance. So that's a very different explanation of knowledge. And we see that we could put it in more simple terms by saying that um, in the Western view, knowledge means that which helps me to enjoy my senses. That's essentially the, that information which I can use as a tool that helps me to enjoy my body, my senses in a better way. That's what knowledge means. And certainly you don't have to have any, um, you know, connection with Krishna for that. As a matter of fact, it probably helps if you don't. Um, now, what we mean by knowledge is knowledge of what's actually going on here and how to deliver ourselves from the material uh, confusion and entanglement that's a very different uh, concept of knowledge. And for that, certainly you do need to be favorable for, to Krishna. Because if you don't have the final thing to connect everything to, whatever knowledge you have is only um, sort of free and floating. It's not anchored to anything. And it will ultimately not give you anything substantial that will last the years or help you in your dark hour. You know, uh, so this is again why um, these two concepts of knowledge are very different in, in the Western world. Uh, in materialistic thinking, knowledge means to help me to enjoy my senses. In the Vedic perspective, in the spiritual view, knowledge means to help me get out of the predicament that I'm in. I was just thinking, uh, you know, today that uh, when we were in the spiritual world, we were with the Supreme, and uh, we became envious. We were thinking, well, why does Krishna always have to be at the center of everything? Why can't I be at the center? And so, therefore, we get pushed out of the material world, and we come here. And I was thinking, as we fall here, the radio is playing... I can't get no satisfaction <laughs> by the, the Rolling Stones. And then after we knock around in this material world for uh, thousands and thousands of lifetimes, you know, and we discover that everything is uh, a mess here, then the radio starts playing the song by the Eric Bird and the Animals. We gotta get out of this place. <laughs> you know? So we we come here and we think we're going to enjoy, but we can't get any satisfaction when we're here. And then after some time, you know, uh, we come to the stage where we recognize that there's something wrong about this place, and uh, there's no way to completely fix it. The only way is to get out of it. And, and that way is to go back to the spiritual world. But to go back to the spiritual world, again, we have to be favorable to Krishna. You can't go back there if you really don't want to be uh, 
uh, connected with Krishna if you don't want to serve Krishna, if you're not favorable to Krishna. You wouldn't like it there. They, didn't, they wouldn't want you there. Um, and uh, so that, again, is why we're saying that uh, Krishna is saying, I'm giving you this knowledge because you are my friend. Yes. So, in like both of the last, uh, you know, answers that you gave, you said that you need to be connected to the final truth, right? right? And like our practical minds, when we are starting out, we're like, okay, how? Like, I want to develop faith. I do feel peaceful certain times when I think about it. But how do you actually develop complete surrender to the knowledge, or mm -hmm. how do you completely trust? the process or trust Krishna or yeah like because the practicality overtakes right a lot of times or maybe that's called material world I'm not sure mm -hmm. but how do you flow in the process right yeah. that's a very good question yeah. uh Oh, I'm s I should have been having people. Of this is. I can I can I can pass it around. Okay. If you so, like March. Uh, well, maybe it was pointed at you. <laughs> uh, I forgot that I have this other little microphone that I pass around, not to amplify people, but because this will get uploaded that way. Your questions get heard by the audience out there in uh, YouTube land. You know. So, at any rate. Um, Prabhupada always taught us that um, you don't accept Vedic knowledge um, blindly, nor can you accept it wholeheartedly. Uh, you can't accept anything wholeheartedly just from the very uh, first time or even uh, in the beginning uh, of hearing about something. Uh, something has to gradually become um, close to you, uh, this knowledge, this process has to gradually sort of seep in. And as it does, we become more committed to it, we become more aware of it, and it has an effect on us that's much more profound. It, it gradually grows. Uh, just like if um, you were going to go to college, and you were wondering, well, what college should I go to? Well, you could ask around, and uh, different people could suggest various different colleges that you could attend. Um, and you could make a, um, a reasonable uh, assessment of what different people told you uh, about the various colleges and their ranking and their um, curriculum and their efficacy and their standing, etc. Um, but ultimately, you're going to have to go to the college and then you'll get a sense of whether what you were hearing about the college is correct or it's completely off the mark, you know. Uh, and you're not going to know by your first week or two in the college which of the two it is you know you're going to have to go for some time so similarly we say that there's a distinction between what we call gyan and what we call vigyan vigyan is realized knowledge and gyan is theoretical knowledge in the beginning <coughs> we hear vedic ideas we hear the processes described and these are theoretical to us we understand them at least superficially we understand uh, um, the theory of what they are and how they work but then we actually have to do them we have to implement them to deploy them in our lives and when we do that then we begin to get the understanding of well is this just a bunch of hot air or does this really work and uh, um, the reason some of us have been here so long is because obviously the answer for us was that it worked, you know. And uh, as you continue, you want to go deeper. And as time goes on, you become more and more convinced that there really isn't anything else. That, um, you know, uh, people can talk about other philosophies and you can uh, hear from others uh, various other philosophies and you can report back. But after some time, you become convinced that there 
There's no other philosophy like this anywhere in the world, nor is there anything that's as practical for cleansing your life, for cleansing your consciousness, and for actually making you tangibly happy. You know, uh, that um, uh, it's, as they say, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. So uh, we can talk about it. We can philosophize or conceptualize about it. But um, ultimately, what we need to do is to uh, hypothetically accept, well, this sounds good, seems reasonable, let me give it a whirl. So we try it, and we try it for a while, and we see, are we becoming purified? Are we becoming happier? Do we get deeper realization of the same things that are being talked about? And if so, well, maybe this is actually worth investing deeper in. So that's how I would respond to your question. Does that? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we have a question back. Now we. Okay. From here. So. Uh, I was wondering in the five elements that you mentioned, uh -huh. like the earth, fire, water, etc., um, where do the three gunas fit in, mm -hmm. in uh, how Krishna puts it into the universe? Yeah, okay. So, um, it's described that... Um, In the beginning of creation, this is explained in two or three places in Srimad Bhagavatam, that um, there is, first of all, um, well, let me go to the um, uh, Brahma Samhita, where it says, um, yes, ya, yeah, what is it? Yasya prabha prabhavato jagadanda koti koti shvaseshu vasudadi vibhuti binam tam brahma nishkalam anantanam anantam anantanam cha something like that uh, govindam adi purusham tamaham bhajami that the Supreme Lord Krishna his effulgence is the Brahman and it's from this Brahman that the material universes are generated. So, uh, the um, Pradhan is the undifferentiated material version of the what we call the Brahman. So, it is non-differentiated. It's one um, homogeneous energy something like the white light. The Brahman is the white light. So the Pradhan is something like that. And it has no directions. It has no specifics. It has no details. It is just a homogeneous energy. Now, when the Supreme Lord glances at it, it becomes agitated. And when it becomes agitated, it begins to separate out into the three gunas, you know, the mode of passion, the mode of ignorance, and the mode of goodness, rajas, tamas, and sattva. So it begins to separate. And then false ego is generated, ahankara. And from ahankara, false ego, and uh, it merges again with the mode of ignorance, and the material elements are created with that merging, you know. So, first you have the undifferentiated, then you have the false ego, then you have the three modes, and then after the three modes are created, the mode of ignorance of the three modes merges with the false ego and creates the material elements. That's where they're the, uh, their origin is. Now, there's other things. When the mode of goodness merges with the uh, uh, false ego, then the demigods are created. When the mode of passion 
merges with the false ego. We get the senses are created, the five knowledge acquiring senses and the five working senses, etc. So this is kind of described as an unfolding process and um, the details are given in Srimad Bhagavatam in two or three different places. It's, it describes this whole unfolding process of how we go from this kind of material homogenous energy towards a gradual these are all very abstract energies still you know the false ego and the three modes of nature and then eventually we get the universe the way we see it today you know uh, these energies differentiate out and they become more specific and then they interact with one another in a very specific way and we see the uh, universe that we see today. That's kind of given you a sort of a summary, but um, not much more I can uh, give you as far as that goes. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, We're going to bring you this uh, to speak okay. so there will be people on the left can hear Yes, I have a question, and I might be rather ignorant, and I'm going to apologize in advance. But <laughs> I had yesterday, Don't worry about it. Yeah, I had yesterday a discussion with a, uh, not a guru, but a spiritual leader, I think there's a word for that, mm -hmm. who I ask sometimes when I have a question. And we were also talking about the path. How do you know that you're on the right path? Or how do you devote yourself to what you'd like to do? And we talked about pain and pleasure, and actually the the past, you know you're on the past when you're actually neutral. Now, if I understood you correctly, what you were describing earlier, when you feel happier, when you feel you're in a, in a spot where you want to be, that doesn't sound like neutral. Mm -hmm. that, sounds, that sounds like another, you know, another, another way of saying, you want to be over there rather than where you are. You want to be over there rather than where you are. Uh -huh. And I'm not sure if I understand it correctly. Right, right. No, uh, what you've said is a kind of thing that I think a lot of people, um, when they're first uh, learning something about spiritual life, a kind of issue that they uh, come on to. Now, the first question that you have to ask yourself is, what is my real ultimate goal? You know, uh, and you'll find that people, especially in India, uh, there are all kinds of spiritual practices and teachers there. Some that are traditional, some that are not at all traditional, some that are making it up as they go along, um, and so forth. So uh, the question then is, the central question is, what do I really want? You know, uh, do I want to be even? Do I want to be delivered? Uh, do I want to uh, serve the Supreme Lord, the Supreme God? Because depending on what you want is the kind of path you're going to go towards or you should go towards no no point in accepting one kind of a path that actually goes towards a different goal than the one that you've actually set for yourself now what we're suggesting here is the highest and only true goal is to develop a deep loving relationship with God that's the highest goal it's not to be even it's not to go to the heavenly worlds. It's not to become famous. It's not to develop mystic powers. It's not to um, find yourself in a, in a state of mind where nothing either affects you or disaffects you. <clears throat> Those are not goals. I mean, they can be for some people. But we claim that such things are not actual real goals you know um, now we are saying that to be totally devoted to God one has to be totally free from material desire now we're saying here material desire now there is such a thing as spiritual desire 
mm-hmm. because uh, being free from desire, nobody can be at any time anywhere in the universe because even if you want to be free from desire, that's still a desire to be free from desire. <laughs> so everybody has some kind of desire. Now the question is, what's a material desire and what's a spiritual desire? And we're saying <coughs> that we are trying to get rid of material desires, not spiritual desires. So spiritual desires have a place. And uh, what is the spiritual desire? The spiritual desire is to um, want to uh, please the Supreme Lord. Now, it is true that we want to please the Supreme Lord, and we don't exactly care where that leaves us, because the idea of serving the Lord means we are serving the Lord without motivation and without interruption. So we're not serving God because then God will turn around and make us happy or make the world a bed of roses for us. That's not why we're serving God. We're serving God because it makes him happy. And uh, But paradoxically, when you make the Supreme Lord happy, you automatically become happy yourself because you're a particle of the Supreme Lord. So if you are working at trying to please the Supreme Lord, automatically, even without any separate endeavor, you yourself will become happy. It's a byproduct, but it's not the goal of why we're doing that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Uh, Marjan, this can be the last question. Okay. This is the last question. Hare Krishna Maharaj Very nice. Can you knock the uh, and uh, the AC down a notch or two? Talk to Sasha. Talk to Sasha? Oh, on this side. Yeah. Maharaj, this is not a question. This is just a comment. I just uh-huh. want to uh, add Krishna says that once you come to the material, uh, spiritual world, by loving Him, you know, we don't, uh, uh, we are not subjected to four kinds of material miseries right. that you just read in, in 13th right. chapter. Janma mirtu jarabhyadi dukha dosa anudarsanam. That right. we don't take birth, we don't die, we don't get old, we don't get disease. So that's another uh, advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the byproduct of uh, uh, misery in the material world comes from our sinful action um, feeding back into our lives. That's called uh, karma. Excuse me. When you do wrong things, then as a result of doing wrong things, your um, sinful wrong action uh, causes you to suffer. So if you're not doing sinful things because you're serving the Supreme Lord, then naturally your suffering automatically uh, lessens. You don't you don't find as much uh, suffering in your life. It's a automatic another you know byproduct of uh, the process of Krishna consciousness. Okay, so you're saying now we should do the kirtan final kirtan. Okay. And if-